Big day here for the Fearless Army and the Roll Call Movement. Man, we have a special guest in studio, country singing star John Rich uh, here in studio with us today. John Rich is going to partner with us on Roll Call. This is going to be a great day as we celebrate Fearless being on a roll. Next. Welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Uh, thank you for joining me. Happy Wednesday. Uh, as you guys know, we'll do some Tennessee Harmony uh, today. This episode is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, and seafood all over again by subscribing at GoodRanchers.com. Use my code FEARLESS to get a free $119 Heritage Ham plus $25 off any box with your subscription. Without further ado, I want to introduce our in-studio guest today. It's John Rich. You guys know John Rich, huge star in the music world and the country music world. He's made a song that we'll talk about here that's, man, in the gospel, in the Christian, in the soulful, in the Jesus lane that we'll talk about here in a second. But today we're going to talk a lot about Roll Call 2.0 because John Rich is uh, my new partner on Roll Call. And John, I just want to thank you for coming in studio. Later today, Anthony and Virgil will be here as they always are. Anthony's going to actually join me and John in a conversation in a bit. And Mark Robinson, uh, who's running for governor in uh, North Carolina, he's also going to join us via Skype at some point during today's show. But John, thank you uh, so much. Uh, and I, I want to start by the thing that's most fascinating to me. And it's this song, Revelations, that you've written and shared with me and is going to be rela released later this year. Uh, it sounds like things are going on with you that you're, you're I can, not pivoting, but you want to show a different side of yourself in the music yeah, world. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on your show. I'm a fan. I watch and keep up, and I'm looking forward to June. That's going to be a lot of fun on Roll Call. Um, and by the way, Mark Robinson, before we get into this, I had, I had a fundraiser for him uh, at my house last year. Yes. And, and Mark and I sat down, he goes, do you know any Johnny Cash? I said, I know pretty much all the Johnny Cash. He goes, do you know I've been everywhere, man? I went, yes. And so there's a video of me and Mark and I'm playing the guitar and he's going, I've been everywhere, man. I, you should get him to do that, man. He kills it. So tell him I said hello uh, when you talk to him. Awesome. I, I will do I that. I love him. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but that's how much the revelation. No, I got you, man. Excites me. Th that song. Listen, people that are even agnostic, atheist, people that blaspheme God with every breath that they have of every day, are seeing things going on in the world right now that they, number one, don't understand, and number two, are scared to death of it. You can feel it in the air that regardless of your politics or where you come from, it's almost like everybody is kind of just, you're just tensed up, like, like there's a giant shoe above my head and when is it gonna come down on my head? Everybody's feeling like that all at the same time, and including me. And so last fall, I was sitting around and all of a sudden, man, this did not come like a regular song would. A regular song for me, if I'm gonna write a straight ahead country song, I'll pick a little bit, come up with a cool melody, or I'll have a, I'll have a song title or something kind of rhyming, and I'll start chasing that, and I'll turn it into a song. That's not what this was. So this literally, it, it just kind of like a hammer in the back of the head. Bang! And I went, what is that? And I could, I could hear the melody, and I, the words were all kind of hanging right in there, and I said, okay. Almost like I'm looking up, okay, you want me to write that? That's how I felt. And so I stopped what I was doing, sat down, and in about 90 minutes, I had written this song, Revelation. And I have searched the internet for any other song, whether it be country rock, even Christian music, that steps into the subject matter of what John wrote in the book of Revelation about what's going to be going on in the end times and leading up to the end times, because I believe that's what a lot of this looks like. And so 90 minutes later, this thing was written, and... Um, put the melody to it, and you're one of the only people that has heard it. My family members have heard it. 
people I do business with very closely, Big Kenny, people like that. But outside of that, man, uh, Tucker Carlson has heard it, and you've heard it. You're the only two guys in the media anywhere that have heard this song. And so I started there because when you sent me the song and I listened to it, I was like, holy cow. John Rich did this, and that anybody made this song is like, holy cow, this is necessary, it's what we need. It spoke to me, it shook me. It's the same way when Aaron Lewis, in, in a different, it shook me even more, but in a, similar to how when I heard Aaron Lewis's Am I the Only One. Mm -hmm. And so getting that song, I immediately texted you and was like, holy cow, man, this is incredible. And then I was like, you know what? This song is speaking to me so heavily, and clearly what's on John Rich's heart, it made me say, well, man, John, let me be greedy here and ask you, would you have any interest in partnering <laughs> with me on Roll Call? Because yeah. my whole vision for Roll Call is about inspiring men in particular to just come together across all these little superficial differences, and let's just glorify Jesus Christ. Let, let's glorify our Savior and our common belief in God. And I want to use music and food, mm -hmm. and and we'll obviously have we have speakers at at roll call. But I just music and food are two things that bring people together. Mm -hmm. And you can't you know good music regardless of genre. Nobody's getting mad or having huge debates. People just love good music. People love good food. And it made me go, man, John Rich is who I should be partnered with on Roll Call. And so that song inspired me to ask something. I was like, I got no idea. <laughs> John Rich, big country music star, big and rich. He won The Apprentice and all this other stuff. But, but it made me say, oh, man, God is on his heart in a real serious way. Perfect guy for me to partner with. Well, it's an honor that you asked, and I'm glad I'm in town. <laughs> we're, we're doing quite a few shows, but th that those dates were open. I was like, they're open, man. Let's lock them in. So, yeah, that's going to be great. I think it's great that you put that together for, for people, for men to get together and, and talk like that. L last night I was at my uh, younger son. He's 12 at his baseball game. Um, and first game of the season, and he's pitching. He's a lefty. So he hadn't played a game really since last October. He's very nervous. He gets out there, and... He, he pitches uh, 51 pitches, 37 strikes out of 51 pitches, no walks in three innings, which is, a, I mean, that's pretty, I, I don't yeah. care who you are, that's pretty good. And then he had a big hit, you know, he, he, he uh, hit a double, and I'm looking down the fence row at the other team, and there's a dad sitting down there whose kid is playing against my kid's team, and uh, he's got on this, this shirt that you definitely know this guy's a wild-eyed liberal. I mean, you just know it based on what he's wearing and, and everything. And his, he's out there rooting for his son to also hit a, have a big hit and pitch a good game, just like I'm rooting for my son. So in that moment, sitting on the other side of a chain link fence, these two dads, who I promise you have nothing in common, have that in common, that he loves his son, I love my son, we both want to see our kids do great. And I thought, that is quite a, that's quite a, a thing to get a, get a handle on because... We do have that in common, and like you said earlier, does not, doesn't that supersede most of the other nonsense that we're all arguing about? You want your son to do well, and I want my son to do well. Nice to meet you. Connecting all those dots, and whether that guy on the other side of the fence knows it, we all share the same Heavenly Father. And if we cannot uh, come together on those lines, because there's so many things, the media, and, and it feels like the globalists and the elites want to separate us. Oh, John's white, Jason's black, they, they can't get along. Oh, uh, someone's a Catholic and you're a Baptist, don't get along. Uh, he's rich, you're working class, blah, blah. We have to find ways that unify us and bring us back to understanding that we're all image bearers of God and that we're all blessed to live in this country. And, and, and whether these leftists want to acknowledge it or not, those biblical principles in our founding documents that they're trying to overthrow it, it is why they love this country because they complain all they want, but none of them will ever move anywhere. Right. And, and they all admit that this is the most opportunity rich, prosperous, uh, you know, 
place to live and people are beating down the doors, but, but we've so forgotten what the principles were that were instilled in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And, and, and it's because we've lost a biblical worldview. And so that, that's what I'm trying to inspire with Roll Call. And I, I want to use music uh, as a tool to do that. And, and that's why I'm just so thankful and humble uh, that you're willing to well, I can't help wait. Us. I can't wait. You, you make a really interesting point because it doesn't say that our rights are, are endowed by our government with certain unalienable rights. It says endowed by our creator with a capital C with certain unalienable rights. Unalienable meaning the rights come from the creator. But had it said government, let's just say it would have said endowed by uh, the government with certain un inalienable rights. That means if the government gave them to you, the government takes them back away. And by this point in the history of this country, there would be no more rights left if it was left up to the government to give and take. That's a very, that's a really good point. So whether you believe in the creator or not, you're the benefactor of the fact that the, that the founding fathers recognize that's where your inalienable rights come from. They'd have a completely different life right now if it hadn't been written that way. And I'm watching like, people like Bill Maher and other public figures, celebrities, leftists, like Bill Maher has built a pretty big brand on being hostile to religion. But I'm watching him in real time realize, and I had this conversation with Adam Carolla, who's agnostic, not, or what, you know, doesn't have a strong faith or whatever. But he acknowledged to me like, I'd rather live next door to a Christian than mm. an atheist. And I understand the value of Christianity. And I'm watching like Bill Maher is mm. all the attacks on comedians and you can't say this and can't say that. He's been fighting and struggle. Like, where did this come from? And, and he's starting to realize it comes from all this secular values and the removal of Christian values. He has less freedom in a world that's hostile to God than he did in a world that leaned into biblical principles. He's starting to figure that yeah. out of rational people. And, and, and we, uh, Vince Ellison, who's gonna be a part of Roll Call that we've had on the show, he's an author. And, and he's, he said something just like very clearly, the point that you made is like, we have a fundamental disagreement in this country about where our rights come from. And, and there's one group that says it's the government and there's another group that says it's God. And, and people need to understand the, the importance of that disagreement. If you foolishly think your rights come from the government, they're going to take them from you. Right. And, and it's some Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden or who, whoever these people are in government, they can take your speech away. They can force a vaccine on you. Yeah. What they determine is a vaccine. It's important that we understand that our rights come from God. And that's why the First Amendment uh, says don't do anything to uh, limit these people's ability to practice religion and free speech and all that. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing they say is, and here's a gun to make sure the government Can't doesn't take those try things it. from you. Yes. Right. You know, another person that's got that same, that's starting to transition right now in his thought process is Joe Rogan. Yes. Joe Rogan's doing that now. He goes, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much I believe about what's in the Bible, but I'll tell you what, people that really believe that, they seem to be in pretty good shape. They don't seem to have all this mental problems and that they seem like level, good people. He goes, maybe we all need a little, maybe Jesus needs to come back right now. That's what he said on his show. I'm like, okay, we're turning a corner. That goes back to the song Revelation. That is the mentality that is starting to happen in this country. It's happening because of threat, pain, all the bad things that are going on. You know, those are this is this is not a first time story. I mean, you go back and read through the Bible every single time. Uh, Israel, for instance, would turn around and come back to God was after a great deal of pain, a great deal of punishment, pain, rebuke. All those things happened because they had gotten so far off course and he just smacked them so hard that they, they, they woke up and they turned around and came back. But why is America any different than that? We're not. You know, I, I contend that, uh, that 
God does not bring judgment down on, on nations because of the sins of the devil's people. He brings them down because of the sins of his own people. Now, that's something you won't hear preached in churches, but that is a fact. The devil's kids are the devil's kids. He's not even responsible for them. But the ones that say they follow him and the ones that do follow him, they go long enough and let blaspheme reign supreme in the land. And they sit down and they shut their mouth and they won't push back. And they're afraid they're going to get called a bad name or afraid they're going to be persecuted, which it says in the New Testament. Rejoice when you're persecuted for bearing my name. Not, not be happy, rejoice, like be exuberantly happy when you get persecution for, for holding my name up and marching forward with it. Well, Christians have lost that attitude across our country for a very long time. I believe that, that he's bringing down fire and bringing down judgment on our country because he wants his people to wake back up, stand back up and turn around. How did you grow up? I grew up in... Uh, Amarillo, Texas, up in the Panhandle. So we just saw the news of that massive fire blowing through there, right there, right in the middle of that. Um, nothing fancy in my pedigree. A double wide trailer in the Panhandle of Texas, which is Tornado Alley. And we know tornadoes love trailers, man. They love them. <laughs> so uh, that, was, that was our house. My dad's been a preacher since he was 19, uh, generally uh, preaching in prisons or street ministry work or, uh, or missionary work. All, all the time I was growing up, there's not much money in any of those. So my dad did all kinds of jobs. Prisoners aren't great tithers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, yeah the, the prison budget, uh, they don't have a lot for the guy coming in preaching. But I watched him work every kind of job you can think of, from slopping hogs to a night watchman at Emerald National Bank to teaching school, selling cars, guitar lessons, mowing people's yards, detailing cars, whatever. I mean, this dude worked like a like a nut and you go, well, why don't you just go get a real job and preach on the side? Because we got this thing called the right to pursue happiness and his happiness and his calling was to preach to those people. You ask my dad, why are you preaching in prisons? He goes, because they need to hear it more than anybody. They can't get out of there. They need to hear it. All these people walking around, they walk into any church within about three blocks of where they live. These people are stuck. So I go in there and I preach to them and let them know. So I grew up around a guy like that who was totally dedicated to what he knew he was supposed to do, whether it paid him well or not, whether people liked or thought of him well or not. And that, that's been my attitude uh, since day one, because what's there to respect more than that than a guy that's following his call? And your dad sang and played the guitar a bit? My dad's a really good singer, really good guitar player. And so I was about five years old. He said one of his extra jobs was giving guitar lessons. And he goes, you want to come with me to guitar lessons? I'm like, sure, Dad, I'll go. So I followed him in. And he hands me a little plastic guitar and he's teaching adults in a semicircle in front of him. He goes, here, just set off to the side and try, try to follow along. Well, after about the second lesson, he heard me in my bedroom and I'm wearing these chords out, man. I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever done, you know? And so he got me a better guitar, a little better guitar. And I started playing behind him when he would preach. And so that's where I got into playing music was I was doing something with my dad. And then later when I was a teenager, started getting a little more serious about singing and, and then uh, took off and chased it down. And so you guys at some point left Texas and came here? Yeah, when I was about 15, my mother's from Tennessee, wanted to move back. Amarillo, Texas is a rough spot. That's a rough end of Texas. It's flat as a board. Wind blows 35 to 40 miles an hour every day. It's Tornado Alley. Um, I loved it because that's where I grew up. But my mother was like, I got to get back to where there's some trees and water and, you know, some greenery. So we moved back to Tennessee and it was really close to Nashville. So I realized... Wow, there's people actually making money singing in Nashville, huh? Wonder if I could do that. So I started entering talent contests and I got hired at Opryland USA, which was the big theme park back in the day in Nashville. Wish we still had that. And got hired there in my senior year of high school. And that's where I started. And so, I mean, it sounds like, you know, growing up in that trailer and, and your dad preaching in, in uh, prisons, it, it sounds like. You had a lot of privilege that you experienced and <laughs> well, just uh, actually did have a lot of privilege. Yeah, to you. yeah, right. I, 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 <laughs> I, I get the sarcasm. Uh, you know, the privilege I had was the privilege of being around somebody like that. Who that's? I mean, this guy's a lightning rod. I mean, he could take the lightning and throw it both. My dad went to thirty-six Mardi Gras in a row and stood there on the corner in the French in the French Quarter with a guitar around his neck, singing gospel songs and preaching. 
And there's one picture of my dad I saw where his guitar looked like it was wet or something. And I'm looking at this old picture. I said, what's that on your guitar? He goes, oh, that's spit. I said, you spit on your guitar? He goes, of course I didn't spit on my guitar. He said, I was singing. He said, the uh, gay pride parade came by and they all took turns spitting all over me, spitting. And he said, they covered me head to toe and spit. And I said, you just stood there and took it and kept singing? He goes, yeah. I said, why did you do that? He goes, because about one out of 500 of them would stop and ask me what I was talking about and wanted to know what I was talking about. Now, growing up around somebody like that is privilege. That's real privilege. And I, I, I know the joke, but that's how I look at that. Thank God I was around somebody like that as a, as a model to when you know you're supposed to go do something on behalf of the boss, you do it. It don't matter if they're spitting on you, cutting you up, calling you names, tearing you down. That's part of it. Be happy when they do that. that that's a real story. Did your, did your dad still preach? Yeah, he does still preach. Would he come to roll call? Oh, he might. Would Boy, that'd be something. He doesn't venture out a lot like he used to, but yeah, I'll, I'll invite him. Oh, please do. He is something else. He don't play around. He is not easy when he preaches. You know, that's one reason why he was never in big churches is because the way he preaches, man, it is. I mean, it's all it's all deadly accurate, but it can get people's attention. Did y'all ever clash about the music industry that you? Oh, God, to? yes. I was prodigal son number one when I got out there on my own and started making music. You know, you go from growing up around that man to save a horse, ride a cowboy. <laughs> my dad goes. Yeah, I heard uh, some of the neighbor kids were singing some song. They said they heard you singing on the radio. I said, yeah. He goes, something about a, a cowboy or something. He didn't even want to say it. I said, yes, sir. He goes, you think you ought to be singing stuff like that? And I said, well, the first song you ever taught me was Johnny Cash, Folsom Prison Blues, which says I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. He goes, well, that's a good point. And he goes, are you going to tithe? on the song and anything else? I said, 10% or more, Malachi 310. He goes, well, if you tithe on it, then I guess it's all right. T tell your so that's the way that went. And then he, he kind of backed up and went, okay, we'll see if he does the right thing. Well, tell your dad, I'm gonna talk you into doing a remake of the song, Save Yourself, Side With Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that could be, man, I would love uh, to meet your dad and so, now you guys would have a great conversation. Is your mom also still? Yeah, she's still around. And and so how are these? You've had a lot of success. I'm sure yep. you've shared that with them. How are they? They're out of the trailer now, I would imagine. Yeah, everybody's doing pretty good now. And, you know, that that's uh, I think one one thing we're told to do is if you if you're given excess, you're supposed to find other people that need it. And of course, your family members are number one first. Make sure everybody's taken care of and then look for other people and take care past that. And, you know, that's part of tithing, too. It doesn't have to go to a church. There's nothing that says 10% to the church. It says 10% back to God. So whoever he puts in your purview that needs some help, needs some assistance, whoever that is, that's tithe. That's where you're supposed to put it. So we always look for people we can help out. So I've been to your house for several charity events or political events, and, and, and I'm wondering if you ever plan to move into politics yourself. I get asked that all the time. I got asked that yesterday here in Nashville. I was on with Matt Murphy, who's a big local radio guy at WTN, and we, I was on there for an hour, and he said, all these people calling in, the main question is wanting to know if you're going to run, will you run for governor or run for something in, in Tennessee? And um, my answer is, First of all, I detest politics to such a degree. I've been around so much of it, just like you have. It is so disgusting on every level. And right now I'm raising two boys, Cash and Colt, 12 and 14. I'm trying to get them ready to walk out my door one of these days and take this whole zoo on. So I have nothing in the near future that, that would make me want to do that. Plus, he, he hasn't told me to do that at all. Matter of fact, the opposite. Like, nope, I know everybody's asking you to do that. That's, I don't want you doing that. Someone told me, and perhaps it's bad gossip, but that you have said you had a dream about being uh, like as a kid or whatever, like, hey, one day I'll be president. Is, did, did, is that gossip, bad gossip I heard? No, that, that was definitely when I was probably 
a teenager, a young teenager, I, I had several premonitions about that might be something I could do someday. You know, it's kind of in the back of my mind. I will tell you this, man, there ain't a politician out there right now, uh, short of maybe Trump or somebody like that, that would want to square off with me about what's going on because I have no allegiance to any of them, no loyalty to hardly any of them, very few. And I know how nasty they really are. You know, they fight on TV like the WWF, and I've, we all watch that, but I've seen them in the back rooms. I've seen the Democrats and Republicans at these events when they light up their cigars and pour the cocktail, and I hear what they're talking about, and they're back there cutting us into fish bait is what they're doing behind the scenes, glad-handing each other, patting them on the back, kissing them on the face. They don't hate each other. They're part of the same, same problem. So if I ever decided to step into that, it would be to go for the kill shot, without a doubt. It, it would be... I would have to be so upset about what's going on, which I am right now, and the timing would have to be right. But if I ever tore into him, man, it would be it would be quite a scene. You wouldn't see a guy with any fear, I can promise you that. You and I were talking uh, before the show about what's going on in New York uh, with the... Uh, mm -hmm. They arrested a woman who tried to put squatters out of a house yes. that she owned. It, and it, it's like, <clears throat> I'm 56, and I just can't, I can't, how did we get here that homeowners can't put squatters out of their house without the homeowner ending up in handcuffs? Yeah, so the lady inherits the home, and it's valued at over a million dollars, inherits it from her mother, she puts it on the market, wants to sell it, and finds out there's a bunch of people, like eight or nine people living in this house, so she shows up, and she's like, you get out of here right now, you know, and it's pretty brave of her to do that, changes the locks, and they put this lady in cuffs and haul her off. I guess that's how New, what New York has devolved into and other cities too. But I was uh, in Tennessee. They got a, a rule here called the Castle Law. And the Castle Law says that your home is your castle. So if you're the man of the house, you're the king of that castle. If you're the lady of the house, you're the queen of that castle. And it says if somebody breaches into your house through a window, through a door, or whatever, you have the authority at that point to use deadly force on that person, no questions asked. They came into your house, you can take them out. And apparently they don't have that in New York. So, you know, I think that's why you maybe don't see as many squatters in Tennessee. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe they know that rule. But on top of the, the squatters thing, man, you've got a, another judge saying illegal aliens should be able to uh, own handguns and uh, own guns. Well, if that's the case, then why, we don't need background checks anymore. Just get, get rid of the background yes. checks and do away with the ATF, because why does it matter anymore if literally anybody and everybody can have one? I, I, I was telling you this before the show, but I've legitimately reached the point where I'm afraid to travel to New York or L.A. or some of these more liberal cities and states that I used to really enjoy. I hate to admit it, but I used to really enjoy. But now I'm afraid. I did, too. I used to love going to New York. Do, do you... Pr perform there now? Absolutely not. I've said no to a couple of shows that were uh, one in New York, one in LA. Absolutely not. Now I'll play upstate New York or I'll go play uh, Riverside, California. You know? Orange County. Yeah, I'll go play out there, but now I'm not going in there. I mean, it looks like uh, it looks like Thunderdome to me on the news. And, and, and at any minute, you know, so many people have come across that border and we don't know who they are from all these other countries. And a lot of them, uh, state sponsors of terrorism. These people are coming in. At what point do these bad people activate? At what point are you traveling and you're in one of those big cities that are loaded up full of people and all of a sudden, boom, 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 and here we go and we're off to the races. I think, I think the American citizens right now, regardless of their politics, are all concerned about that. You know, they have sent them literally to every city out there. And, uh, you know, my friends uh, in the military tell me that there are terrorist cells in almost every single zip code in the United States, literally everywhere. And I'm like, well, why don't you go in and bust them? They go, because they haven't done anything yet. I go, haven't done anything yet. They go, right. So it's a, it's a powder keg. I think that's probably a, a, a light way to put it. Do you feel the same way about that when you see the situation? Absolutely. No. They're everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, I live in downtown uh, Nashville, and uh, I live on DeMumbrian, right in the little party area. 
uh, pay a lot of money to live, to yeah. live where I, I live. And uh, my street is dangerous. They, they you know, I, six times a year, someone gets shot on my street. Mm. Because uh, it's in the little party area, and, they, and just I'm keeping it real. There's a cl club on my street that plays hip hop music, and people get shot there. And 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 my concern about this political year is part of the reason why I bought a house now, uh, more out in the burbs, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't want to go into detail. Yeah, don't say where it's at. <laughs> Yeah. Don't say where it's at. The yeah. cameras are on. <laughs> yeah. but, you can but, tell me later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, and and it's really to get away from the cities, and and I'm I'm you know just honestly I'm halfway afraid of the the police force in terms of their lowering standards, and I think that's going to make the cities more dangerous. I just watched a, a local news show. They did a whole three minute segment on. I apologize for this, but I'm just keeping it real about how they want to get the, the law enforcement up to 30 percent women. And I'm like, <clears throat> are, are we sure that's about safety? Are, mm -hmm. are we sure? And, and I don't with all these people we've allowed into the country, gang members from South America and all this is women police officers. That's the solution. How about let's get the police force up to 30 percent where 30 percent of the police force can run a five second. 40 yard dash and bench press 250 pounds. That'd be nice. Yes. Let's get some speed and muscle. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's like they are, they are designing this and constructing this to fail. And I don't mean women are gonna make something fail. I mean, they want to relax, like, like fire departments, for instance, you know, same thing. They're like, used to, to become a fireman, man, I mean, you had to be a, damn near an Iron Man to, to yes. be a fireman. You got to pull this much weight, climb this many stairs in this amount of time, and on and on. And they, they're now lowering those standards. You lower those standards, and just how does that help us take Twin Tower situation, where those very brave firefighters who were even in condition to go up all oh, those yeah. stairs, and just because people don't understand, it's like it's in a man's nature a properly constructed man, he will take a bullet and die for what he believes in. That's our, our role in society. We should be willing to lay our lives on the lines for him and to protect women and children. Mm -hmm. Women's nature is to protect their womb. That's in their nature, and they sh it should be. It's proper structure. But, but we want to now force them into all these dangerous situations that just isn't right, and then just the lowering of standards in terms of, uh, you know, I've seen some cities where I think they're overlooking, maybe if you even had a little police record or trouble, we're just allowing more corrupt people right. into law enforcement. That's not making us safer. It's not what we need to be doing. And so, uh, you know. And now they're wanting to allow uh, illegals, people that they have no idea who they are, into the United States military. Yes. And they're gonna be, and so, they have no constitutional rights because they're not a citizen of the United States, but they're gonna point a gun at me and try to take my constitutional rights away. So. Right. <laughs> this type of discussion and the seeds that your dad put in you, and I mean, man, you come from very good stock based off what you're telling me about your dad. It's, it's uh, I just gotta go back to again. Man, I'm so honored that you are partnering with me on Roll Call. I really, really, we will, uh, and I'm sorry, Gaston, President, he, he'll be upset that I'll say, I'll, I'll pay your dad to come. Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, uh, he, would, he wouldn't take it. He wouldn't take it. But I, I will, I'll let you two have a conversation. I'll put you on the phone together or meet you for coffee or something and let you get a load of this we guy. We will not censor him if that's what he's worried about because we're fearless. I'm yep. not scared. <laughs> we will yep. not censor him. Yep. Uh, but I, I want to bring uh, Anthony uh, into the conversation. I want to introduce you to Pastor Anthony yeah. that works with me on the show. Uh, before we do that, uh, guys, I want to talk to you guys about preborn as we sit here today, the lives of babies still in the womb. Hang in the balance. I want to talk to you for a minute about the most important and pressing issue of our day, the lives of the unborn. They need our help. The ministry of preborn empowers young expectant mothers in the crisis to choose life. Preborn has rescued hundreds of thousands of babies' lives through ultrasound. 
When a woman considering abortion visits a preborn center, she gets to hear her baby's heartbeat and meet that precious child on ultrasound. And it's a divine, life-changing encounter. The majority of the time, she will choose life for her baby. I'm proud to be affiliated with an organization that's not only working to save lives, but is succeeding. Preborn has a passion to save unborn babies from abortion and see women come to Christ. Over the past 15 years, preborn centers have counseled over 450,000 women considering abortion and over 200,000 babies have been saved. Those are amazing numbers, but we can do better. Will you help us rescue babies? To donate, dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby. Or go to preborn.com slash fearless. And when you do, email me, fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. Uh, Anthony Walker joins us next. Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here. Harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? His ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, and his cowardice, his rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the most high. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O-W-T-H actually stands for, for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R, responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God, family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him far more than popularity and material possession. The H, humility. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0, right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. Welcome back. A, a special edition of Fearless today, uh, where we're celebrating Roll Call 2.0. We're celebrating the fact that John Rich, major country music star, uh, is joining and partnering with me on Roll Call. And so I wanted to introduce Anthony, you guys obviously know Anthony. He's been with the show virtually all three years, yeah. uh, always here with us on Wednesdays, Tennessee Harmony. I wanted to introduce Anthony and John Rich to each other uh, so that Anthony could give him a little bit of a sense of roll call. And then I wanted John to tell Anthony about your dad and your background. And the He told an amazing story mm. about his father, preaching on the streets and just repeat that story again just okay. for Anthony's benefit and Anthony I just want to hear your reaction yeah, to it. Yeah. So I, I grew up uh, around my dad which at age 19 started preaching and um, he never preached in the big churches or anything he was he was a prison preacher or he would preach in the streets and my dad 
hit 36 Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras in a row without missing one. Every single year in February, he would drive down there. Yeah. And he would, he's a really good guitar player and singer, so he would go down there with a guitar hanging around his neck, stand there in the French Quarter on a sidewalk and start singing, and then he would start preaching. And there's this old picture I ran across one time looking at of him in Mardi Gras, and I said, what's that on your guitar? What is, is your guitar get wet? He goes, oh, that's spit. And I said, what? I said, why did you spit on your guitar? He goes, I didn't spit on my guitar. <laughs> he goes, no, I was singing, he said, and the gay rights parade came by, and they all walked over there and made sure they all spit on me as they were going by, and he said, I had it in my beard, I had it top of my head all the way down, dripping off my guitar, and I said, why in the world did you just stand there and let them keep spitting on you? He goes, well, because about one out of 500 of them would stop and ask me what I was talking about, and then I'd get yeah. to talk to them and witness to them. Yeah. And I went, wow, he goes, he goes listen, son, you got to remember this. Uh, he tells us to rejoice when you're persecuted. Yes bearing my name yeah he said getting yeah. spit on is being persecuted yeah. that's exactly what that is he said so i didn't like getting spit on but i was happy that what i was saying got their attention enough that they would actually come over there and take a minute to spit on me <laughs> it meant that my message was at least getting to them so i was happy about he that he said they took took a time to to spit on him took the time to spit on him wow. right so that that attitude is something I've taken on, and, and in 2024, that's a that's the only attitude that'll work anymore. Because right. if you're afraid of persecution or afraid of somebody coming after you, calling you a bad name or whatever, and doing what most people do, which is shut your mouth, sit down, and try to be invisible, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's why we're in the shape in the first place. Right. We've been too many too people silent. been doing that for way too long. Yeah. So that's kind of been the attitude I've adopted, uh, and I had a, had a good guy to teach it to me. You know, a couple of scriptures come to mind as you share that. Uh, Acts chapter 5, uh, the apostles are preaching, Peter's preaching, and they are persecuted because of that, threatened, arrested, uh, beaten, flogged. And in a moment, you know, Peter says in verse 29, we've got to obey God rather than man. But towards the end of the chapter, the text says that they were rejoicing because they were counted worthy to, to suffer like Christ. And so right. that's what the attitude your dad is having to say, hey, man, I, I'm being spit on for this gospel that brings life. This is what they did to Jesus. This is what they're going to do to me. And so then the other passage that came to mind, uh, Peter talks about this, that, you know, in the last days, scoffers will come. Those people who are strategically going to make fun, to spit, to, to cause whatever friction, because the gospel that you're sharing speaks against their lust. You know, you mm -hmm. tell somebody you can't sleep with whoever you want to. I don't want to hear that, you know. And so we have to be courageous, bold enough to stand on the truth um, and understand that that comes with it. And so twisting it like your dad said, hey, they took the time to come spit. Like this must yeah. be a well, good and word. What you just said, they're also talking about scoffers in the, in the, yeah. towards the end days. It also says it will be as, as it was in the days of Noah. And what were they doing to Noah for a hundred years when he was building that boat? <laughs> right. Scoffing at him, the mocking him thing. every single day of his life. You idiot, what are you doing right. building this boat? Right. What an idiot. And they scoffed him until it started to rain. Until and the rain. Exa you're exactly right. Yeah. There, there's a lot of parallels that I think people are starting to, the Christians are starting to put together and, and wake them up and go, hang on, dude, is it time for us to wake up now? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's time for you to wake up now. Yeah, we've been, Look at what's happening. We've been snoozing you. too long. <laughs> Anthony, and so just, just think, because Anthony's been with the show for so long, and so when we started out, me, you, and Bobby Harrington, mm -hmm. and I kept talking about, like, we got to figure out ways to bring us together uh, across these petty differences. Mm -hmm. and, and I was sharing with you all, I was like, my, my vision is we're going to use music and, and food to bring everybody together, and we're just going to honor God. And so when, when John sends me his revelation song, mm -hmm. I'm like, man, this is God telling me this is my musical partner. Mm -hmm. And then to hear John unpack, like, this is the stock I came from. Mm -hmm. This is my dad. We were in a trailer park. He chose prison ministry and ministry that wasn't going to make him rich. He's... I got to witness him make these sacrifices. It's, I really feel like God made John send me that song and 
opened my mind of like, this is the musical partner mm -hmm. that I need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, even even the testimony, the background that you point, point out, his father in ministry, it's all feeding into this moment. But what I like about this moment is it's strategically hitting the men that we wanted to hit, the men who may not feel the place that in the world, you know, the world has kind of edged out a courageous man, a man who is good in, in nature, a man who's a good husband, a good father. The world has edged him out and, and then the enemy picks that up and runs with it. But here's a, an area, roll call, that we're saying, hey man, it's time to stand up. And even just putting that environment together, men are gonna be attracted to that because they know when I show up, man, I'm gonna get a good song, I'm gonna get a good word, I'm gonna get some good fellowship, and I'm gonna get to be around like-minded men who are trying to change what we have set back and let happen. So, uh, John's got a flight to catch. Oh um, man! And he's going. To, he's performing down in Florida. We're, we're going to let John go, but uh, we're also today going to bring on uh, Mark Robinson, who's okay. running for governor in North Carolina. He's uh, one of my favorite politicians. Is uh, you know, I'm very leery of politicians, but I've seen Mark speak at churches. Man, he's mm -hmm. bold. Ain't but two genders. Uh, he don't play. <laughs> he does not play. Uh, he's going to come on today's show because he's coming to roll call uh, to be one of our speakers. And John, I just want to thank you again uh, for making the time today and for making the time for roll call. And, you know, I just think bigger and brighter things are to come. And, and I hope uh, to get your meet your father, even if he doesn't come to roll call, I may just have to drive out to, <laughs> is it Ashland? You yeah, yeah, I will I'll, I'll set that up. You too. Yeah. Knowing the two of y'all, that would be quite a conversation. I'd like to sit there and hear that one. <laughs> All right, well, That'd be uh, a good one. Safe travels to Florida. Yes, sir. Uh, we'll talk again soon. Uh, I'm sure probably before roll call, I'll be at another event at your house or something. But uh, anyway, thank you, John. You got and, uh, it. Safe Appreciate travels. To you. Yes, sir. All right, uh, when we come back, uh, we'll be joined by Virgil Walker. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about roll call 2.0 and some of our initiatives for this year. I laid out some simple things for us to do since the last roll call or at the end of roll call that, that we were doing. I uh, want to have a conversation with Anthony and Virgil about uh, what's going to be on our agenda, what, what message, what, what disciplines or what behaviors do we want people to adopt over the next 12 months uh, as men as we try to promote uh, growth and sacrifice. Uh, don't go anywhere. Virgil Walker, next. Victor Conte, previously on Fearless. It's a huge problem. And the reason is because those who receive the majority of the financial gain, meaning the owners, do not have a genuine interest in catching those who are using the PEDs. The programs that they have designed are in essence designed to enable them and harbor them from, for using PEDs. So uh, none of the professional sports have effective uh, drug testing programs, no matter what they say. All right, welcome back. Time for some uh, Tennessee Harmony uh, with Anthony and Virgil. Uh, we're going to continue our Roll Call 2.0 discussion. Uh, but uh, Anthony, if you could bless the conversation before we get started. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for uh, Roll Call in and of itself and what it was on last year and what we pray and hope for it to be on this year. Thankful for this discussion and we hope that it inspires and encourages men to be a part of this great event. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, obviously, if you're in the audience, you can hear or sense my excitement about what we have going on this year. We're really elevating things. Uh, I think, you know, John Rich's involvement is going to help. But I also think, you know, the speakers from Mark Robinson to E.W. Jackson to King Randall coming in from Georgia, uh, 
I, I just think this is going to be amazing. And so I, I haven't said it so far during the show. Maybe we played it during a commercial break. Uh, need you guys to go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com, fearlessarmyrollcall.com and sign up. This is going to be bigger and better than anything we did last year. You want to be here. Uh, the vision is coming to fruition. And so <clears throat> I wanted to have a conversation with Anthony and Virgil today about, as, as last year, you know, I talked about three initiatives that uh, we wanted to do last year and we wanted to embrace our Christian identity and, and start living through that identity, adopting that as our sole and primary identity and putting away all the, the Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, put away all those other black, white, whatever, and just be Christian. Uh, we wanted to uh, start our day tuning our hearts with gospel Christian music. Uh, music is such an important uh, communication tool. It can write thoughts into your heart and soul. Uh, and so we wanted to do that. <clears throat> and then we wanted to make Jesus a part of our daily conversation. And we try to help you do that with this show. Uh, in terms of we try to give you things to talk about every day from a biblical point of view. And just and because I think we spend too much time too many of us say the names Trump, Obama, or Biden far more often during the week than we say Jesus Christ. And so we just wanted to get in the habit of making Jesus a part of our daily conversation. And as I said last year, uh, these things I think were very, very easy to do. And that we were going to step up our ask in year two of Roll Call, and haven't decided what those initiatives are, uh, but wanted to invite Anthony and Virgil into a conversation. We'll continue this conversation with TJ Moe and others, but wanted to have a conversation, and would love to hear from you guys in the comments or via email at fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. Your suggestions on initiatives that we can adopt and kind of mandate as fearless soldiers that will help us get in the right mindset for the type of sacrifice we need to make if we want to see the growth that we say we want to have, if we want to see uh, the kingdom elevated, if we want to see things, uh, a better environment and culture for young people and children. Uh, there's some sacrifices we as men have to make. And so what are some things we can do to help get us in the right mindset uh, to make those sacrifices. So uh, with that set up, I want to hear from uh, Anthony and Virgil. Mm. You want to break it up into three different segments, you know, because we've got three different uh, suggestions that you may want to add to the list. So you want me to just give them all three up front? No, we can just. OK, peace. Y'all have collaborated. In that's, how, that's how we do. Oh, yeah. I, I know y'all talk behind my back because that's why Virgil comes on and pats you on the back. Yeah, Anthony. You know, but I, I know y'all do that. But it, yeah, let's talk about them one of Y'all came up with one at a time. Let's, okay. Let's talk about we'll, them one at a time. We'll look at this one. So, um, one of the easier things to do, it sounds complicated, but it's easy to do, and that is uh, disciple one man. When we look in uh, John chapter one, we look at Matthew chapter one, when Jesus calls his disciples, they weren't biblical scholars, they were common men, but as he calls them, they call on others. You know, he calls Andrew, Andrew goes and gets Simon. Hey, come and see Jesus. Come, as I'm following Jesus, I invite you to come and follow him. So Jesus gives us the command, hey, go into all the world and make disciples. So with that said, the, the initiative is one man. Doesn't mean you're a biblical scholar, doesn't mean you know all the Bible answers, but as you're following Christ, be willing to share and invite somebody else, hey, come follow Jesus along with me. Let's get involved. I'll share this and then Virgil, I'm sure will pick up on it. Uh, there's a piece of, of, of research that suggests that out of 100 
faithful people who would say of themselves, we're Christian, we believe, right? Out of 100 people, only three of them, 3%, only three of them in a year's time would share their faith with somebody else. That is just a harrowing statistic to know. 3% of those who profess to be Christians. So we want to up that, especially among men. You're faithful. You say you're a Christian. You love the Lord. One man out of the next 12 months, share your faith with him. Mm. Uh, yeah. And so go ahead and elaborate, uh, Virgil. No, I, I, I'll, I'll just elaborate and sim- simply say it, it piggybacks really, Jason, off of the, uh, the charge that you laid out for men related to identity. Uh, at the end of the day, every every battle that we witness in culture is related to identity. You know, whether I'm, a, I'm my black identity is up front, or my liberal identity is up front, or the LGBTQ identity is here or there, what have you. And I think last year you called men to take a stand for Christ and to identify as Christian, and for that to be primary. And so what this does is that it just it just, all it does is it levels the playing field from a standpoint of going out and sharing that with someone else. Uh, and Anthony laid it out, you know, basically you've got three people out of a hundred will actually share their faith with one other person over the course of a 12 month period of time. That is absolutely abysmal. And so now that we've taken a year to, to, to anchor our identity in Christ, it is imperative that each one of us go out and reach one. So each one reaching one, making sure that by the next time we connect, over that period of time, we, we've doubled our efforts. We quadrupled our efforts. If each one will simply do that, go out, share your faith with someone, share your identity with someone, share what kinds of things cause you to walk alongside Christ and connect with other men who are doing the same. Uh, we'll, we'll see the multiplication effect of this taking place. And it's absolutely a, a biblical way of, of doing Christian life together. I'm going to tell you why this strikes me as like, okay, I'm we're definitely doing this, and th- this is personal. I personalized it, but uh, yesterday, uh, you guys have heard me talk about Dante Love, former Ball State football player who broke his neck in 2008. I was at the game and already knew Dante, but because it went to the hospital, and anyway, it's caused a connection now 16 years between Dante Love and I, and he's like my adopted son. Dante's doing great, but he, he texted me yesterday because he and his wife just had their third baby, Maya. I sent them a nice gift, the baby a gift or whatever. And then he texted me back and he unlooked, you know, a thank you. But then he just updated me via text on what's going on in his mind and what initiatives. He's, he's like, man, I want to get into the stock market because Dante's now, uh, let's if, if 16 years ago, so he was 22. Yeah, Dante's like 38. Uh, and so he's now well off into adulthood and he's trying to up his savings. And so he wants to enter into the stock market and he's just telling me what he's doing. And I read it and and it reminds, because Dante lives in California. And so when I lived out in California, we mm. were much, we were closer and in better communication. He's come and visited me here in Tennessee, his wife and kids. But uh, it reminded me like, oh man, I gotta be in better communication with Dante. He's looking for more advice from me. And, and it made me this morning say, I gotta set up a once a week, set aside 30 minutes, an hour, just to talk with Dante. Mm-hmm. Because he still enjoys and is looking for advice and engagement uh, from me. And so that's a way you can disciple. Mm -hmm. It's just because, again, me and Dante have great debates and conversations about the Bible, but he's also looking for just life advice and looks to me to help him navigate, even at 38, no different than at 56. You know, I still consult with my mother. I consult with my brother. I consult with my sister. And uh, so I, I, I really, okay, that's an easy one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, just picking off what you're saying, you know, putting that time on your calendar for that, you know, the, the word that Jesus uses there is is go, but it is better translated as as you go. So yeah. as you're walking through life, as you're doing, um, 
Include somebody else in that, you know, include someone as you're following Christ, that that opportunity. Hey, man, listen, I didn't really need too much, but I was studying Romans chapter six. What do you think about? Boom. That's as you go. It's not a you know, it, it just kind of helps to to process that. So, yeah, Dante watches this show a okay. lot. Praise God. He sends me texts about the conversations we have. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it, it's just very I just need to put that on my calendar and, and need no different than our Wednesday mm -hmm. Bible yeah. prayer yeah. Uh, conversation. I need to put that on my schedule. So, uh, all right, what's next? So next up, uh, we want to encourage men all over in particular to be involved in a local church. Uh, there is just great uh, biblical instruction and wisdom in being shepherded and being led, being in fellowship with fellow Christians, actively working in ministry in a local church. Virgil, you want to chime in there? Yeah, this, this is just, I mean, this is a, for most should be a no-brainer. Connect. It's, it's very similar, Jason, to what you've tried to create with what you do on Wednesday nights uh, with, with everybody getting on, on the prayer call together. Uh, the gathering of the believers, the opportunity for us to to talk about what's what's going on in our lives, the connectivity that we need. I think it's great to, to, for for roll call 2.0 and, and even the first one to be a catalyst for men to understand their need to be in fellowship with one another. Uh, absolutely, they come to the to, to to our conference. They come to the event. They go, man, this was great. They're energized. They're excited. Uh, as they go back, it's imperative that they get connected in a local body uh, so that they can continue to be encouraged. They can continue to be reminded. They can continue to walk out the kinds of ideas, plans, and be accountable uh, for the things that, uh, that that we talk about there uh, at, at Roll Call, the things that, that they should be receiving uh, from a, a local church with their pastors uh, and the like. Th these kinds of things are critically important to men walking out their lives in a, in a biblical way. And so it's really, really helpful. This is an area where I'm going to be completely transparent. I struggle and I know I'm in the wrong. I've never shared this on the show. Uh, you guys are putting me on the spot, so I'm going to have to share it. But uh, uh, and, and I got to be careful because, I, you know, my mother, aunt, family watch and listen. But I got scarred at the church that I grew up in majorly. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 I got to be careful in how I unpack it, but clearly I need to be in conversation and probably in some therapy uh, about it. And, and I know that uh, uh, young people that I talk with and engage with, I'm not going to call a name, but I, I know someone that, a uh, young person that if I called his name, people would, rem I wouldn't say they have a similar scar, but I know that there are a lot of young people that don't feel like they're getting fed at the church and, and they're committed to doing it on their own. And I know based off of uh, what happened to me as an adult with the church that I hold most dear uh, has scarred me and has made me part of the, re literally I'm just being transparent, part of the reason I bought the home that I have and the way I'm having it remodeled the way that it is is so that I can have church at home. But I gotta work through this in some sort of way, and so that's gonna be part of my focus uh, this year is, is I need, I've put it on the back burner. I know it's an issue. I've, I've, I, I know it's frustrating for people that are uh, supporters of mine. Uh, I know they look and, and question, like, Whitlock, you need a church home. And because I have been homeless, and, and it's been by choice, uh, I need to work through those issues. So uh, what's the third one? Third one, uh, another interesting one, but I believe kind of simple. Um, read a book. Read a book. That book can be the Bible, but in addition to the Bible, I would say, read a book. A lot of men are not, uh, and, and in my experience and in men's ministry, are not readers, are not taking in, contemplating, digesting uh, thought on a daily basis as it relates to what you read biblically, commentaries, or books that are supportive to your Christian walk. And that, again, helps in our journey. Virgil and I were talking this morning. Both of us 
have, you know, extensive, you know, libraries at home that we're constantly taking in as a minister. I'm constantly taking in books, information, biblically, et cetera. But that's feeding me, feeding thought, feeding logic, feeding wisdom constantly so that what's coming out of me, not off the top of my head, is what I've been disseminating uh, for the time. So we would encourage men, uh, read a book this year. I, I would suggest, I mean, we've talked about him, uh, Tony Evans' Kingdom Man. Great book, biblically based. Tony is very practical in his explanation. That's a great book to start uh, for men that are interested in learning to, to really read more on a daily basis. Virgil, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I want to I go back to what you what you mentioned earlier, Jason. I don't I, I don't think you're unlike others. I, I think your story uh, about church hurt is very similar and very familiar. I think there are a lot of people who are in your very same situation uh, who have either avoided church or had said, you know, I, I, or or here's the other issue. I can't find a good church. I mean, we always talk about on this show, you know, we, we look at pastors who are doing the right thing, some who are doing the wrong thing, providing the wrong messages, mm. not, you know, not, not really sticking to the word. And so I don't think that's a, I, I, while it's easy for us to say, I do think it is a challenge for men to try to identify with and, and make happen. And so I just want to, want to validate that, that point. I don't, I don't think it's easy at all. It's a, it's a difficult task. Uh, and I think more people are lending themselves to trying to figure out how do I craft this uh, in a way that makes sense for me. Some, some lean into, I'm just spiritual. You know, I'm, I'm not a Christian or I, I don't go, go to church, but I, it, while it is a challenge, I think it's important. It's, it's an important thing to, to interact with and do that. Finally, with regard to a book. Hold for a uh, second, hold for a, hold for a second, for, hold for, since you went there. I, I, I want to, I don't have a problem going to church. I have a problem finding a church home. And, Absolutely. And, and it, it, it's because again, because what you're talking about, when you have a church home, it's a far more intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And there's, and so when you're homeless and you're just drifting around, it's like dating around. You're not committed. It's, yes. it's very, it's more surface level. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, and so that I think many people have that struggle. Yeah. Uh, and, and I certainly do, but I haven't, uh, I clearly, what, what, I clearly need to be in some discussions and work it because I can't, I've been trying to work it out myself and it's not going well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so well, um, my, I, my, my, com my commentary was less aimed directly at you and, and more and more in a general yep. sense. That I don't, I don't, I think, I think there are right. a lot of people who have experienced the same kinds of things that you, that you have and for, and, and for a variety of reasons, unique to their own situation, uh, have made decisions that, that church isn't for them. Uh, or, or that they don't have a problem going to, but just haven't found a church home, uh, and, and that that is not that is not an easy thing to navigate. It really is, and it requires, in a lot of instances, uh, some help and support. And you know, I I, I don't ever uh, on this show tout what I do here at G Three Ministries, but we 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 spend a lot of time investing and helping people in those circumstances and situations find places that make sense for them. So I, I'll I'll leave I'll leave that there. Um, as it as it relates to um, books, I, I highly recommend men reading. Uh, we have to we have to be men of the word. We have to be men who read the Bible, who read the word of God. It's a daily part of what I engage in. But in addition to that, there are tools that help me to understand what I find more times than not, Jason, is most men don't read the Bible because they have a difficult time understanding how to read the Bible. Uh, it, it's mm -hmm. less about reading words on a page and understand what, in, what the Bible actually means by what the Bible says. We spent a great deal of time unpacking on this show what the Bible means by what the Bible says it, as it relates to issues of culture, uh, as it relates to certain things that are going on around us. W one of the books that, that, I, that I recommend to help men uh, is a book called One to One Discipleship uh, by a man by the name of David Helm. As you can see, it's a very small book, very thin book. But what it does is it helps men to understand basic things that uh, that uh, that Pastor Anthony has taught on uh, on our uh, Bible studies. Uh, context, understanding the context, making observations of the text, unpacking the meaning of the text, and as a result, applying properly applying what we read in the text of Scripture to the life of the believer. Uh, you had on your show, uh, uh, Pastor Vody Bacham. Uh, he has a fantastic book, a lights out book uh, that I that I highly recommend called Family 
shepherds. It really helps men in particular, whether they're married or single, prepare for their role as the provider, protector, and priest that God calls us to be. And so those are just two good books uh, that, that I highly recommend. But, but overall, just encouraging men to be readers. And if you're not one who likes to put your eyes on the page of a, of a particular book, uh, I, I think it's incredibly important for you to be audio booking. If you're one of those people who are, who are auditory learners, you can listen to a book be read uh, and maybe capture some of the ideas and, and, and uh, make, you know, take you on your way. It's another good way uh, for things to, for you to, for you to get really solid uh, biblical understanding uh, into your brain. Obviously, I like the reading aspect because I'm a writer, and uh, I would make this argument. I want y'all's reaction. I don't think it's ever in our lifetime, and maybe in several, maybe ever, <laughs> has it been easier to read the Bible and get an understanding of the Bible yes. than today. And I say that because, again, it's just like, I've been reading Romans, oh, and I can go to YouTube mm -hmm. and find an endless amount yes. of, here, here's a guy for an hour talking about his interpretation of Romans. Mm -hmm. Here's another guy with his explanation. Mm -hmm. here, I can get on my Stairmaster and the words from the Bible on screen with this beautiful James Earl Jones type voice <laughs> reading the Bible to me yes. while I'm on the Stairmaster. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I don't think it's ever, because again, I was someone that's like, the Bible's written in a way that it's not my style of writing or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that was, but there are so many tools, readily available tools mm -hmm. to help you understand the Bible that, again, that weren't readily available. Basically, you know, when I grew up as a kid, all we had was the King James version of the Bible, <laughs> and that was it. Yeah, there yeah. weren't these detailed commentary Bibles available to mm -hmm. you, and mm -hmm. all this other stuff. Th there are so many different tools available that one have made it more fun and entertaining, in my view. Fun, uh, all right. Yeah. It, it really, I mean, it's fun a, Bible study. It, enjoy. <laughs> Because again, yeah. anytime I get on my stairmaster, I'm looking for something that's going to take my mind off of me punishing myself. Oh, gotcha. And yeah, I actually gotcha. enjoy gotcha. listening to people talk about what I just read, listening to someone read me the Bible, and, and then I read the Bible, and then I listen to someone read. But I, I do think it's easy. But, and then the other part of this, even if it's not the Bible, the other thing I heard from Anthony and you, Virgil, that, that's unstated is that because we're not reading and, and because so much bad information is being fed to us through our cell phones, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. our point of view is very, very narrow. Yeah. Yes. We don't have a wide perspective. And that's what books, you don't have to get on a plane to visit Paris. You don't have to get on a plane to visit Africa. You don't have to understand the world. You don't have to have to set feet on the ground. Now, maybe it's best for your understanding, but a book can broaden your perspective. Yeah. And too much of our perspective is narrow. And that's why we personalize everything. This is only happening to us. Mm -hmm. and it's never happened to anybody else. Right, it, right. Our point of view is so narrow because we don't understand the world. We don't understand history because we're, we're, we're counting on Twitter to tell us what to think. And that's not Twitter, that's yeah. not their strength. Twitter is your curated version of what you want to receive. You, you right. curate your list, you follow who you want, and even those that you follow are feeding you what they want to feed you, the news outlets, the, all of it's going directly the way. But when you read a holistic book like the Bible, it gives you all of God's you know, wisdom that he gives us pertaining to life and godliness. He gives us all of this. And then you've got others, as you pointed out, that give you so many different layers and perspectives on this same thing. Uh, it, it helps as it relates to the goal of this roll call, growth and sacrifice. It helps you to grow spiritually. It helps you to grow in wisdom and in perspective. Now, what will it take? There's the sacrifice piece. You 
you know, discipling someone else. There will be a sacrifice of time. There'll be a sacrifice of convenience from time to time. But that is helping you to grow spiritually, them to grow spiritually. You deciding to uh, become a part of a church, as you've pointed out, even for yourself, for those who struggle in that area. There is some growth and sacrifice that become a part of that. But again, biblically, the blessings so outweigh those. And then lastly, reading a book. Man, it's not like watching a TV show, but all oh, the blessings that come, yeah. especially from reading the words of God. Actually, reading a book is better than a TV show, in my, but I'm a writer. But you're a writer. Yeah, I'm a writer. <laughs> it's hard. I've never, it, again, it's like, I love Roots, the miniseries. Yeah. yeah. Then I read Roots, the book, and was like, holy. Yeah. Oh, they can't, they can't give you what, they can't <laughs> give it to you on screen, what's in the book. Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll agree with you there. Uh, Virgil, you'll have final say here, and uh, I'm, I'm going to bounce you two guys and uh, talk with uh, Mark Robinson. Yeah, no, I, I think the biggest challenge that Americans have in particular uh, is the fact that we are, we are more biblically illiterate now than we've ever been in the history of our country. Uh, that's why I think reading, reading a book, beginning with the Bible, uh, is critically, critically important. Use, utilizing the tools, Jason, that you mentioned, uh, that Anthony mentioned, in an effort to ensure that we understand what the Bible means by what the Bible says, we apply it to our lives and, and, and live lives that really, that really amplify uh, the glory of God. That's what we need to do. I'm excited that, that this is, will be something that, that you'll be talking about at, at Roll Call 2.0. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and I would tell the audience, fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Go there now. Uh, get your tickets. You need to be here in Nashville. It's going to be tremendous. It, it, it's the guys you see listed there. We got even more to add to that. But, you know, that's John Rich and myself and Mark Robinson and Glenn Beck and King Randall and Vince Ellison and E.W. Jackson and Tim Floyd, the NBA. There, there, there's even more that we'll add, but uh, it's going to be amazing. We got to have you guys here in Nashville. Fearless Army Roll Call 2.0, fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Uh, go there right now. Uh, Mark Robinson, he's the lieutenant governor of North Carolina. He's the GOP nominee to be the governor of North Carolina in the 2024 election cycle. He's going to join us next. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're going to roll out to North Carolina and bring in uh, the Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina, the 2024 Republican candidate for the Governor of North Carolina, and the politician who gave the greatest speech I've ever heard inside of a church, ain't but two genders, uh, Mark Robinson. Uh, let's play the Mark Robinson sound, sound bite or clip at the church, and then we'll uh, bring in the next governor of the state of North Carolina. Here's something else I'm not supposed to say. Ain't but two genders. Two genders. Ain't nothing but men and women. And I can already see WRL out there, they got their licking their pencils right now. Trying to write fierce as they can. Get every word of this here. Get every word of this. You can go to the doctor and get cut up. You can go down to the dress shop and get made up. You can go down there and get drugged up. But at the end of the day, you were just a drugged up, dressed up, made up, cut up, man or woman. You ain't changed what God put in you, that DNA. You can't transcend God's creation. I don't care how hard you try. The transgender movement in this country, if there's a movement in this country that is demonic and that is full of anti the spirit of antichrist, it is the transgender movement. It's time for grown-ups and time for Christians to start standing up and being unafraid to tell the truth. Come after me if you want to. I don't care. You want my head? Here it is right here. Come on, come get it. I don't care because it's time for us to stand up. Now I'm not afraid to stand up and tell the truth about that issue. 
They're dragging our kids down into the pit of hell, trying to teach them that mess in our schools. Tell you like this, that ain't got no place at no school. Two plus two don't equal transgender. It equals four. You need to get back to teaching them how to read instead of teaching them how to go to hell. Yeah, I said it, and I mean it. Uh, a man I've dubbed the notorious GOP, a man that I believe may be president one day, Mark Robinson, uh, welcome to Fearless. And thank you so much uh, for agreeing to come to Nashville and speak at Roll Call 2.0. Uh, Mark, what inspired that sermon? At that, at that, did you know going in that you were going to go there, or did you just get overcome and just let it rip? Uh, well, first off, thank you for having me. No, I went into that uh, knowing what I was going to say because I believe that, uh, you know, when it comes to spiritual matters, we should not hold back on our convictions. You know, everybody in this country wants to have their convictions to believe that, you know, that men can be women and, that, and vice versa. And they want to go into our schools and they want to espouse that. And I believe that a church is the place where you're supposed to be able to espouse your uh, spiritual convictions. And that's exactly where we did it. And we don't back up from that one bit. Mark, uh, how is your election race going? I mean, obviously, we're thrilled you won the GOP primary. Uh, you got the wind at your back. How, how are things going uh, headed towards the general election in 2024? Uh, it's going very well. It's going very well. We've, uh, we're up in, in our polls here. Uh, we just had a poll where four points up over our, uh, uh, over our opponent. And uh, every day, everywhere I go, we get a ton of support across the board from all sorts of people. Uh, I just can't believe the amount of support that we have rolling in from the very moment we won the primary uh, from all across the country, folks are getting in. They're realizing the importance of this race. It's going to be the number one governor's race in the country. It's going to be the biggest governor's race in the country. And the road to the White House, of course, leads right through North Carolina. And that's why this race is going to be so important. And so we're getting a ton of support, not just at home, but from abroad. And uh, we couldn't be more pleased. How is your message and being a Republican candidate how is it being received by black North Carolinians? Uh, well, when they hear the unadulterated message and when they move, move through the, uh, uh, the, the half-truths and the lies that are being spread by the mainstream media, when they hear our message on the economy and how we want to spread our economy and build our economy across North Carolina, as I say, from Murphy to Manio, uh, Manio uh, Murphy being the furthest western point, Manio being the furthest eastern point. How we want to make sure that everybody, no matter where they are in North Carolina, has the opportunity, has economic opportunity, strong economic opportunity. When they hear that message, when they hear our vision for bringing classical education back to the classroom, and they hear our vision of making sure that parents not, not some uh, all-powerful school administration, but parents are in charge of their children's educational destiny. When they hear these things, they're greatly encouraged. They love the message. And I believe uh, the more we spread that message, the more folks are going to vote for us, and we're definitely going to win in November. Do, do you think the Republican Party is being remade in real time right now? And I, I see you as being a big part of the Republican Party getting comfortable with representing the working class and middle America. I, I see a great pivot and shift going on in the Republican Party. Do you feel that as well? I feel that, and more importantly, uh, my opponents on the opposite side of the aisle feel that. That's the reason why at 10 o'clock uh, on primary night, uh, the national media immediately begin to come after me because they see me as a threat. What they see is a black man who is about to, uh, who is attempting and has a very good chance of taking the helm at a, of a pivotal state here in our union uh, that can change voting dynamics 
in, not only in this in our state, in the state of North Carolina, but can literally change voting dynamics across this country. They cannot tolerate that. They want black folks to be continue to be beholden to a party that does not serve them well, doesn't serve their communities well, are not delivering the things that they promise every two, four or six years. And they don't want someone in office who's going to continue the growth of North Carolina and do great things in North Carolina uh, and will change voting dynamics across this country. It's the most dangerous recipe for their side of the aisle that they can see, and that's why they've come after us so hard. I think part of this awakening, particularly among black voters, is, is just what's going on at the southern border and this illegal immigration issue. I think that is really resonating with all of America, but with black America in particular. It is. It is. You notice what happened in Chicago, uh, the protests that they had in Chicago over the amount of, of, of illegals that were uh, being brought into the city. Uh, right here in North Carolina, uh, a little in a little small county up near Virginia, Gates County, uh, we had a uh, an illegal who was captured uh, after a, 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 over a huge after a huge struggle, a four-hour standoff, he was captured. Uh, turns out that this guy's from somewhere around the area of Yemen, and he's actually on the terrorist watch list. And he was plopped down right down in, in this, this small county, Gates County. Uh, the sheriff there only has 12 deputies uh, at hand. Uh, and, you know, when you look at this and folks are seeing this, uh, and they're seeing how ordinary Americans and veterans and, and the elderly are all being shoved aside and uh, all of these giveaways are being given to people who have broken the law to come here. To come here, uh, It's infuriating to them. They feel like they're being left behind. They feel like they're being uh, disregarded. And they feel like their safety is in peril right now. And so it is definitely changing dynamics in those communities. What has been your leading message? What are you telling people in North Carolina? What's going to be different when Mark Robinson is governor? We are going to focus on the substantive issues that all North Carolinians face. And those issues stem from our education system and from our economy. When you talk about the economy, economies are built on pillars. And those pillars are public safety, public education, health care, infrastructure, and housing. Those are the things that we're going to focus on delivering to the people of North Carolina as we have a purview of as elected officials. And the public education piece, I separate that out only because I feel like in North Carolina we need to make some substantive changes to get back to where we need to be to be successful in case through 12 education. But those are the things that we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on growing this state and the people thereof, because North Carolina has a grand opportunity right now uh, to become an economic superpower, an absolute economic superpower. And we want to be part of the process that makes that happen. One of the speakers we're going to have at Roll Call is a guy named Vince Ellison. And Vince has written some books, and he's He's distilled things down about what's going on in America in a way that I think is really easy to understand. There are those of us who believe our rights come from God, and that there's another group of people who believe our rights come from government. And, and when I see you stand boldly in a church and stand on truth, I, I know that comes from a place of like, I serve God, and that's where my rights are coming from, and, and we have to come off this dependence of government. And we keep making government more and more of our God, and we're out of order because of that. But, but I, I love the way Vince has unpacked that and tried to uh, get people to understand. If you don't understand that your rights come from God, you're lost and you're more like, <laughs> that's why you love the Democrat party, because you want more government and less God. And, and, and then there's those of us that again, are on the other side of that and say, we answer to God and they wrote this constitution in a way, the first amendment is protecting, stopping the government from infringing upon our rights to worship however we want and our free speech. And then in the second part, the second amendment is, and here's a gun if they try to take that away from you. It's just as fundamental as that to me, Mark. 
It is. You know, we broke away from the British for independence, and now we have a party that is dead set on trying to make people dependent. That's not where we need to go. Look, uh, I, Jason, I firmly believe this. The two problems that this country has more than anything, the two entities that are failing our nation more than anything, are politicians and pastors. Politicians are failing our nation because they've forgotten their founding document. And what is their founding document? Their founding document is our Constitution. And pastors are failing this nation because they've forgotten their founding document. And what is that? It's the Holy Scriptures. The more we get away from those two things, the more we see ourselves falling into chaos with a wide open border, with law and order out of control and a failing economy. I believe when we turn back to those things in their separate spaces and have them working in concert with each other, we'll see our nation start to grow again we'll see better days. Mark, I, I want to thank you again for agreeing uh, to come speak at Roll Call. When you get here, I'm going to have a special gift for you that I think you're going to love. Uh, I'm going to take this notorious GOP, and I've got my guys working on a song, uh, Notorious, and it, 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 I got the hook in mind. I got everything in mind. I am notorious. It is glorious. He is notorious. He is glorious. That that's and I can just see people chanting it and and just anyway, when you get here in June, I'll have that gift. We're going to bring you out probably right at 11 a.m. to kick us off and get us started at roll call. You got a fl flight you need to catch, but you're the perfect guy uh, to kick this off. And we're going to play that song and have everybody fired up. And man, uh, whatever we can do here at the Fearless Army uh, to support you, just let us know. And we, we got your back, brother. Thank you so much, Jason. We certainly appreciate you. We're looking forward to the event. That's Mark Robinson. Uh, that's today's episode of Fearless. I do want to remind you about what we got going on Thursday and Friday. You do not want to miss these two special episodes, Diddy and the Shocking Truth About Hip Hop. Thursday and Friday, NCAA tournament. Know what you guys are going to be into. And, and you know, you got sports to watch. And so we want to counter program and give you an alternative. You can watch, listen to us as you watch basketball and think about the NCAA tournament. We're going to give you some alternative programming, Diddy and the Shocking Truth About Hip Hop. It's going to be must-see TV. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. So divided, stop fighting and stand tall. We used to be a nation, one united. Now we're headed for a downfall. God let your light shine down. What we need more than anything now. Harmony. Let's make a simple vow. Let's come together now. Harmony. Get to 